So I wanted to share with you the first chapter of our new novel, That's How It Goes. For regular viewers of the channel, you may recognize some of the characters, for many of them are based on the real men and women that we've profiled in our short long videos. I won't give away the whole story, but we get a lot of tear emojis in our comments, a lot of appreciation for our Greatest Generation heroes, and I promise you'll have the same reaction to the book. I promise. Enjoy the first chapter and stick around to the end of the video for a bit more commentary and a chance to win a signed copy. Enjoy. Pre-dawn darkness shrouded the countryside as the roar of engines pierced the stillness. A C-47 transport plane hurtled down the runway, lifting into the moonless sky above southern England. The aircraft rumbled onward, dim lights barely illuminating the cramped interior. Amidst the din, Robert Hickman took a deep breath, steadying his nerves. He was accustomed to the persistent roaring of the aircraft by now. The past few hours had passed in a haze, gearing up, boarding just after midnight, fruitlessly trying to catch a few minutes of sleep. Robert gazed out the small window beside him. Far below, the inky abyss of the English Channel spread out, dotted by the outlines of waiting Allied ships. He steeled himself for the trials ahead as the drone of engines carried them toward their destination. As he glanced around the plane, the other men in his stick seemed lost in their own worlds, girding themselves for what was to come. Their faces betrayed the emotions churning within. Fear. Excitement. Determination. Robert caught glimpses of wide eyes, furrowed brows, nervous lip-biting as the plane's interior lights swept by. These were mostly young men, many embarking on their first combat jump on this early morning. Sprinkled among them, Robert noted a handful of grim-faced veterans who had seen battle before. Their hands clutched rifles with casual familiarity. Robert's own face revealed an unexpected calmness. At twenty years old, this would be his baptism by fire. But his jaw was set with resolve. He had trained for this moment for months, pushing his doubts aside. Now, with the French coast fast approaching in the dark hours of June 6, 1944, he was ready. The hum of the engines faded as Robert's mind drifted back to simpler times. He thought of his hometown in Connecticut and his time at Norwalk High. Leaves of red, yellow, and orange carpeted the ground as he pedaled away from the red brick school building. As the final bell rang, students streamed out of the school and rushed toward buses, cars, and bikes. Seventeen-year-old Robert coasted down the tree-lined neighborhood streets passing the familiar shapes of neatly kept single-story houses. His was one of many working-class families that called this place home. Turning onto his street, Robert hopped off his bike and walked it up the front steps. He leaned the bicycle gently against the side of the house and went inside, ready for an evening of homework or listening to the radio. It was a simpler time, though the war raging in Europe rarely strayed far from people's minds. As dusk fell, Robert emerged from his room at the sound of his mother, Doris, calling him for dinner. Doris Hickman was a sturdy woman in her early forties, with naturally wavy red hair she kept neatly pinned back. Though faint lines were starting to form on her pretty face, after years of worry and hard work, her blue eyes still radiated kindness. Robert sat down to pot roast, mashed potatoes, and green beans, one of his favorite home-cooked meals. After eating his fill, he cleared the table and fell into the familiar ritual of washing dishes alongside Doris. Standing side by side at the sink, Robert handed each freshly cleaned plate to his mother. Her focus stayed fixed on the task of drying them, while Robert tried engaging her in conversation. Mr. Creighton in social studies said that it's only a matter of time before we're dragged into the war in Europe, Robert said, eager to discuss what he'd learned. If Britain falls, Creighton thinks we'll be next. A lengthy, awkward silence followed, filled only by the clinking of dishes. Doris did not seem to register the gravity of her son's words. Mom, am I boring you? Are you listening? Robert blurted in exasperation. Doris continued drying the dishes, her lips pressed together in visible annoyance. She refused to look at her son as he persisted in trying to discuss the war. What do you want from me, Robert? she finally said sharply, scrubbing the plate in her hands. I'm not as worldly as your Mr. Creighton. Stop thinking about war and focus on college next year. She paused, her voice softening. 
It's the only thing your father ever wanted for you. Doris's words trailed off as she stared distantly at the soapy dishwater in the sink, momentarily lost in bittersweet memories. Robert stopped handing her clean plates. He moved closer and gently placed a reassuring hand on her shoulder, taking the plate from her hands and setting it aside. Doris seemed frozen in place, caught between past and present. I know, Ma, Robert said gently. I'm going to college, I promise. But the world is changing. You heard President Roosevelt on the radio. They attacked one of our ships off Iceland. It's only a matter of time before they come for us. Robert's voice dropped to a pained whisper. If we go to war, I can't just sit in a classroom learning geometry and playing in the band when everyone else is enlisting. I just can't. I'm sorry. I have to do my part. He moved slowly back to the table to gather the remaining dishes, heavy-hearted but resolute. The bell rang, jolting Robert from his thoughts. All around him, students burst out of their seats, making a beeline for the classroom door. As the din of chatter and shuffling feet filled the room, Robert gathered his books unhurriedly. He glimpsed Mr. Creighton at the front of the room, already erasing the day's lessons on the Battle of Britain and Lend-Lease from the blackboard. Robert felt a pang, wishing the discussion could continue. There was still so much to understand about the war in Europe. Brushing past him, Robert overheard two students discussing the prospect of America entering the war. My old man says it's the Japs we have to worry about, not the Germans. They're tricky, said one boy. He says that cause you're German, scoffed his friend. I don't see the Japs conquering Europe, genius. Robert couldn't help but crack a wry half-smile. Everyone had an opinion, it seemed, though few understood the global forces at play. A familiar, slender figure sidled up next to Robert, snapping him from his reflections. It was Robert's friend Sal Variano, his dark, tousled hair and soft face bearing an uncanny resemblance to a young Frank Sinatra. Sal's expressive eyebrows were already raised in anticipation of venting about the day's events. The two fell into easy conversation as they walked to Robert's locker. Sal's voice took on an insistent, escalating urgency as he described the shame Benito Mussolini had brought upon his Italian immigrant family. My brothers hate Mussolini. Hate, Sal emphasized. They're embarrassed. I'm telling you, they might swim across the Atlantic and start fighting, Sal insisted, only half-joking. I'm not kidding. Robert looked at his friend with a mix of amusement and bemusement. Sal had a flair for dramatic pronouncements, but his frustration was real. If America entered the war, Robert knew Sal's family would be among the first in line to serve, eager to prove their loyalty. Sal's agitation grew as he continued to rant about the injustices faced by Italian immigrants like his family. Tony is gonna enlist for sure. He says we all have to. He's tired of us being called greasy wops, Sal said, his voice rising. Old Lady Dolman shot us a look at the market, like we support Mussolini. Can you believe that? Robert could see Sal getting increasingly worked up, as if trying to talk himself into the convictions he was professing. I'm going to join the army as soon as I turn 18. I don't care what my pop thinks, that'll show him. We ain't disloyal, I really am, Sal insisted. Reaching his locker, Robert calmly placed a hand on Sal's shoulder, hoping to ease his friend's fervor. Opening the locker with his other hand, Robert empathized. I know, I know, you're lucky that Tony is so gung-ho. I can't even discuss it with my mom. It'll break her heart when I enlist. I'm the man of the house. I need to do my part. Robert became lost in thought, staring blankly into the depths of his open locker. She wants me to stay 12 years old forever, he finally said somberly. Maybe she thinks it'll bring my dad back. Sal replied gently. I mean, you're all she's got. Maybe just go to college. Nobody will hold it against you. Robert slammed the locker door shut. I'll hold it against me, he stated. His mind was made up despite understanding the heartache it would cause his mother. Several days later, Robert tagged along with Sal to the Variano household. From the sidewalk, Robert could glimpse activity stirring within the modest home. Stepping inside, the scent of Carmela Variano's savory cooking filled the air. Sal's mother shuttled between the stove and dining room table as she prepared a feast for her bustling family. 
Sal's little sisters, Maria and Izzy, were parked on the living room floor, listening intently to the radio, playing a tune Robert recognized as Chattanooga Choo Choo. Meanwhile, Sal's father, Giuseppe, sat engrossed in an Italian newspaper, oblivious to the din. Sal's boisterous older brothers held court in the corner, engaged in their typical spirited debate. Fordham got crushed by Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Pitts won three games all year. Stop with this shaketsi about Fordham being better than Notre Dame, the broad-shouldered Tony insisted. Little Joe laughed heartily, defending Fordham's honor despite their recent drubbing by Pitt. Robert watched the familial chaos unfold with amusement and envy. He had always loved the spirit of the Variano home, so unlike the subdued austerity of his own household. For better or worse, life with the Varianos was certainly never boring. Little Joe laughed loudly, saying, Seven blocks of granite? Remember them? We went to every game in 36 and 37. You were cheering louder than me. Have some loyalty. The word loyalty triggered Tony. A look of anger flashed in his eyes. Loyalty? He retorted. Angelo Bertelli is the best quarterback in the country. He's one of us, and he plays for Notre Dame, not Fordham. Don't tell me about loyalty. The brotherly bickering had been drowning out the music from the radio until Frank Sinatra's I'll Never Smile Again came on. The Variano sisters perked up instantly. I can't hear Frank, younger Izzy exclaimed, while she and her sister gazed adoringly at the radio. Nobody cares about stupid football, Izzy added emphatically. Stop listening to that bum, he'd be nothing without Tommy Dorsey, Tony scoffed, referring to Sinatra. Little Joe let out a loud guffaw. What about loyalty? Isn't that bum one of us? He retorted, catching Tony off guard. Tony fumbled for a rebuttal to reconcile the clear hypocrisy. After a few seconds, he managed a weak response. He doesn't work for a living, he sings. He ain't gonna win no Heisman Trophy. Sal was amused by the entire exchange. Mimicking Sinatra, he grabbed an imaginary microphone and crooned along passionately. For tears would fill my eyes, my heart would realize that our romance is through. It was an unpolished but convincing rendition that held everyone's attention for a moment. Tony finally had enough. Okay, Bello Ragazzo, that's enough, he said. Go help your mother bring the food out. Sal took a mock bow before heading to the kitchen. Robert stood awkwardly off to the side, trying his best not to be noticed amidst the familial chaos. Tony waved dismissively towards the kitchen, where Sal had gone to help his mother. Talk some sense into lover boy, he said to Robert. Robert just stared back blankly, unsure how to respond. World don't need more singers, we need fighters, Tony continued gravely. We're about to go to war. This got Robert's full attention. He slowly walked closer to Tony, eager to engage him on the pressing subject. Our social studies teacher, Mr. Creighton, he began, but Tony cut him off, the words spilling out in frustration. This Mussolini sickens me. We get called WAPs, no good Italians. People stare at us like we made a deal with Hitler. I'll be the first to go over there, and the rest of yous are going too. I'll be right behind you, Little Joe quickly agreed. Robert thought he heard Sal mumble something in response as well, though it was hard to make out the Sinatra song still playing in Sal's head. I don't know what we're waiting for. We should just declare war on those bastards, Tony declared vehemently. Guarda che dici, Carmela Variano suddenly exclaimed from the kitchen. Robert wasn't sure if she objected to Tony's use of the word bastards or his put-down of Mussolini. We should, Ma, Tony yelled back unapologetically. By now, the dining room table was fully set with Carmela's sumptuous cooking on display. The smells wafting from the kitchen made Robert's mouth water. On the radio, the upbeat Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy by the Andrews sisters came on, diverting the Variano sisters' attention. They hopped up from the floor as their father folded his newspaper and rose from his chair. Venite a mangiare, Giuseppe declared, summoning everyone to the feast. The family convened around the table and took their seats. Robert found himself at the far end next to Sal, with Giuseppe assuming his rightful place at the head. As everyone bowed their heads for the customary blessing, 
It took Robert a moment to recognize what was happening before he clumsily followed suit. Giuseppe Variano bowed his head and began reciting the blessing in Italian. Bless us, O Lord, and the food we are going to have, he said solemnly. Let it not to lack to anyone anywhere in the world, especially to children. After a brief pause, he enthusiastically concluded, Mangiari! Carmela started serving the feast, beginning with her husband. Dami il tuo piatto, she directed Robert, indicating for him to hand over his plate. As Tony began eating, he turned to Robert with a probing look. So you a dreamer like Sal, or you got your feet on the ground? Robert was caught slightly off guard by the question. Um, I, I don't know, he stammered, glancing at Sal for help, but finding none. I'm definitely no singer, if that's what you mean, Robert finally managed. Tony pressed further. No, funny guy, what's your plan? Now Robert was genuinely baffled. Plan for what? Plan for what? Tony asked incredulously. We know you can't sing. Can you fight? It took Robert a moment to realize what Tony was implying. Yeah, I can fight, he stated firmly. Hickman, that's German, right? Tony questioned. German is two ends. We're English, Robert corrected, slightly annoyed at the assumption. Wouldn't matter where I'm from, Tony. I'm American. If we go to war, I'm going to war. Just then, Sal quipped. You mean if your mom lets you? The comment drew giggles around the Variano dinner table. Robert felt his face flush pink with embarrassment. He turned to respond to Sal, but at that moment the radio stopped playing Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. A hushed silence fell over the room as an urgent news bulletin suddenly came over the airwaves. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin from the United Press, the announcer declared gravely. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. President Roosevelt expected to address Congress tomorrow. Stay tuned for further developments, which will be broadcast immediately as received. All regular programming suspended. Disbelief and shock registered on the faces of everyone seated around the dinner table. Even the steady ticking of the grandfather clock in the background seemed to fade away as the broadcaster detailed the unthinkable attack. A stunned silence lingered in the room for what seemed like an eternity. Checo era cuello? asked a confused Giuseppe Variano, unsure of what had just happened. We're at war, Tony responded softly, dazed and still trying to absorb the shocking news himself. Vieni di nuovo? Giuseppe asked again, not comprehending. We're at war, Tony repeated more emphatically, snapping out of his stupor. The weight of his words seemed to sink in for everyone seated around the dinner table. On December 8, 1941, crowds packed into darkened movie theaters across America, still reeling from the stunning news broadcast over radio airwaves the prior day, Pearl Harbor had been attacked. As the haunting images of destruction and billowing black smoke flickered across movie screens, hushed audiences sat riveted. The grave voice of the newsreel narrator rang out. The U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, was the scene of a devastating and unprovoked sneak attack by the Japanese forces in the early morning hours of December 7th. Their plan was straightforward, destroy the Pacific fleet. Hundreds of fighter planes descended on the base without warning, where they damaged or destroyed nearly 20 American naval vessels, including eight battleships and over 300 airplanes. More than 2,400 Americans died in the attack, including civilians, and another thousand people were wounded. The attack took place at the exact same time the Japanese ambassador was meeting with Secretary of State Hull to secure peace in the Pacific. Footage showed the smoldering remains of the USS Arizona as it sank. Calcified bodies of sailors still manning anti-aircraft guns sat frozen in time. As the Pearl Harbor images faded from the screen, a heavy silence lingered in the darkened theater. Shock, grief, and smoldering outrage mingled in the air. Sons, brothers, fathers, and friends would soon be called to war. The America that audiences had known and loved seemed to disappear in smoke along with the devastated Pacific fleet. Driving toward the market on that otherwise ordinary morning, Doris couldn't help but notice an unsettling quietness pervading the normally bustling streets. 
As shopkeepers raised metal gratings and unlocked doors, the customary chorus of lively chatter and activity felt muted. Approaching the central marketplace near the docks, Doris slowed the car. Something else unusual caught her eye, a line of men snaking around the building of the Army Recruitment Center on 18th Street. Even at this early hour, the line stretched far longer than Doris had ever seen. Pulling the car over, Doris parked across from the recruitment center and gazed at the solemn faces awaiting their turn to enlist. A tinge of dread crept over her as Robert's boyish visage flashed in her mind. Resting her head wearily on the steering wheel, Doris stared helplessly at the line of willing soldiers that was growing by the minute. Though it pained her to admit, she knew with chilling certainty that her beloved son would soon feel compelled to join them. So I hope you enjoyed the first chapter. We may do videos on additional chapters depending on the response to this. Certainly feel free to go to Amazon and order a copy and leave a review. Like I mentioned at the top of the video, Many, not all, but many of the characters are loosely based on real people that we profiled. I could tell you that Robert Hickman, the first character you met, is absolutely inspired, I think based is too strong a word, by a real person. As you progress through the book, there's elements of the story arc that will seem very familiar to our regular viewers. Leave in the comments who you think it might be based on, and I'll select a few winners to receive an autographed copy. If you think the first chapter sounds a lot like a movie script, well, there's a reason for that. I initially wrote it as a movie, and then I wrote the novel afterwards, which is usually backwards, but that's the way I saw it in my head. When it becomes a movie, and I'm certain it will be, that big family scene at the Variano house when they learn about the attack on Pearl Harbor will be an awesome one. If you're like me, from a big demonstrative family, you could practically feel that scene playing out. I think the Sinatra songs are critical to the scene, so hopefully we'll get the rights for that. Thanks for watching. We may do another chapter. Leave your thoughts in the comments to win a signed copy and feel free to go to Amazon and get a copy and leave a review.